face, man. Familiar face. まだ親父が俺に食われるところを見てないぞ。父さん、グリサは。兵器の持ち止めを貯められていた。感謝してるよ。兄さん。兄さん。あんたが俺を親父の記憶から自分の未来を見た。あの景色を。たまき。I <laughs> <laughs> すべての弓の民から生殖能力を奪え。お前に従ったことを後悔した。父親の記憶からどんな未来の景色を見たのか。お前は全てを見たわけじゃないんだろ。例えば、お前がここで子孫の力を失うことだ。お前は無力なままだ
ブリッツの名のもと憎き回れを滅ぼせこう、just like Historia A lot of parallels Hmm, still no expression change I think I know, I think I know those three Or the names of them at least It's gotta be Maria, Rose, and Sina, right? Look at that, maybe the inspiration for Helos? Oh, yeah. This is such a cursed existence for Ymir. Fucking hell. This guy, man. Even now. Okay, so she got transferred? Or she created it? God damn, that's barbaric. Mm-hmm. Mm, look at that three. One for each daughter. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Unreal. Wow. Even in death, even after death. Wow, this existence is beyond cursed, man. This is. Wow. Waga Bosho ni Uitemo, Waga Erudia, Konoyo no Daichu, Kotai de Shihaish. Wow. Wow. Wow, I loved how that cut in. Mm. Mm. There it is. Mm, yeah, it was. She wanted Aaron in here. To you, 2,000 years in the future. Ah, oh, Zeke. Oh, no. To give her a choice. As an equal. As a human. As a person. Rather than just commander. And Zeke just did. Great shot. That's the same look Aaron had, right? On his face. Wow. Look at that. Whoa. <laughs> How about that shot? I've seen something similar a long time ago, right? It's happening. Right now, it's happening. Stampede of the Titans. But there's gonna be a lot of collateral damage though, right? Wow. Holy shit. Kinda sounds like a, a track from Inception. Wow. Jesus. Yeah, collateral damage. Even on Paradis. Yeah, it's like his new Titan form, but it's it's that thing. Incredible new score. Wow, Armin is really just. Yeah, he knows. He kind of knows, but he's still kind of shocked about this. He didn't want to believe it, did he? But. すべての弓の民に積む。
parody. Ooh. Is, is that Annie's dad? この島の外にある全ての地表を踏み鳴らすそこにある命はこの世から駆逐するまでわあ。Wow. That look. That's kind of like a new look for him. Fucking hell, man. That was terrifying. <laughs> that didn't even feel like Aaron anymore. That was like something else, man. That was something out of a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, the look on Historia's face. But yeah, man, holy shit. It's happened. <laughs> and I love how, I love how, you know, that final shot of a really twisted, almost demented looking Aaron to a young Aaron in, in the ending here. Jesus. All right, man. Let's let's tackle this episode. This is wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it appears that season four, part two, uh, has its own trifecta of phenomenal episodes, right? Two brothers, memories of the future, from you, two thousand years ago. And how about that title? How about that title? You know, it's come full circle. Um, this is unreal, you know. Isayama san is delivering right at the, the the conclusion of the series. You know, these episodes, you know, it's amazing to see that this late in the series, there's episodes coming out that are that are able to contend for, you know, top 10, top 5 spots. Um, you know, a lot of times that's not an easy thing. It's just not. Sometimes a lot of the best episodes of a series come a bit earlier, right, in the story. Uh, but here you have, near its conclusion, some of the best episodes of the entire series, right? Playing out. Um, this is insane. This is insane, you know? Uh, this trifecta of episodes could easily rival any other trifectas of Shingeki or, you know, pairs of episodes. Um, you know, and it's a bit of an ongoing thing, right? For Shingeki to have a pair of episodes that really stands out or a trifecta of episodes that really stands out. Um, of course, you know, season three part... Uh, part one has its own pair, right? Uh, episodes 10 and 11, Friends and Bystander. Um, season three, part two certainly has its trifecta, right? Perfect Game, Hero, and Midnight Sun. Though a few episodes later, it also has That Day and Attack Titan back to back, right? Um, and then of course, you know, there's a phenomenal run of episodes in season four, part one as well. Um... And, you know, you could go back to season two. Season two has a great run of episodes at one point. I mean, it's an incredible payoff that was set up 79 episodes ago, right? Episode one to you, 2,000 years from now. Now, 79 episodes later from you, 2,000 years ago. I mean, I just can't get over how amazing these three episodes have been back to back. You know, that... I think, yeah, this easily challenges for the best trifecta of episodes in the series, right? Especially given how important they are and the significance of each one of these episodes. Uh, but yeah, they're right up there. They're right up there. Either, you know, any one of those three episodes uh, could be in the top 10 or top 5 even, right? Uh, I mean, of course, you know, they could easily be in top 5 as well. And I'm guessing this probably is in conversation for... Um, you know, one of the greatest anime of all time. I mean, surely it's already in that conversation for a few years now, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing it probably is in conversation for greatest anime of all time, right? In those circles, in those conversations, surely it comes up now. Now, as I'm saying that, I do have to remind myself that the series hasn't ended yet. So maybe, you know, maybe, um, maybe after the series is concluded and it's got, it's got its ending, right? Hopefully a solid ending or a great ending or a good ending even, right? Um, because, you know, up until this point, this show or this anime, this story has been just phenomenal, right? So I feel like even a solid or great or good ending is more than enough. And yeah, you know, honestly speaking, I think uh, it's probably going to be tough uh, from this point on to, you know, kind of rival these three episodes that just happened, right? Those three episodes, I don't know, man, that, that might be the last great trifecta of the series, uh, unless... Again, you know, maybe I'm speaking too soon, but unless there is another, you know, pair of episodes or a trifecta of episodes uh, right near the conclusion, maybe. Yeah, 
you know, I feel like maybe this is the peak of that, you know, double or triple episode lineup. Um, and it's, it is just staggering. It really is. You know, this episode, I mean, you know, it's equal parts enlightening and equal parts just haunting and horrific. It really is. Um, this episode gave me some of the most haunting and horrific imagery of the entire series. Uh, it really did. Uh, but also, you know, in that sense, quite enlightening. It gave me some of the most, um, uh, some of the biggest revelations as well, right? Uh, some of the longest running questions have been answered in this episode. I've, I've been given one of the great backstories of the series. Um, you know, in that sense, before I go any further, I mean, the founder Ymir, Ymir Fritz is, you know, if if I thought any of these other characters are tragic, this is just like another planet. This is a totally different planet in that sense. You know, the founder Ymir, Ymir Fritz is the most tragic character I've seen in anything in a long time. This is, yeah, like I said, it's like a different realm in comparison to like some of these other characters that are meant to be tragic characters. You know, I'm not trying to take away from their um, struggles or anything, but you know, once you see Ymir's backstory, it, it is just insanity, right? Um, it, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. You know, my heart aches. Like just thinking back to her treatment uh, and the life she's lived and just now, you know, just now finally she might be able to, you know, let go. Uh, but even then, you know, it's not, I'm not sure if this is uh, a given that she's free now, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. As of this point, she just agreed to let Aaron uh, have the founding Titan's powers, right? Or the founder's powers uh, to initiate the Stampede of the Titans. I mean, it's a mix of things that Aaron did for Ymir, but, you know, you can see that he also appealed to her repressed anger, right? Uh, and that came out. That certainly came out. Um, so in that sense, it's like, it's kind of like a mutually beneficial arrangement. Um, you know, you have to remember, she had to make the choice. She had to make the choice. And that was the thing here, right? She was given the opportunity um, to make that choice, right? She was made to understand that she does have a choice in all of this, right? Um, this trauma she's been carrying her entire life, essentially as a child, and then she grew into an adult uh, who carried that trauma. I mean, Isayama's son really, really left the, the the final, the most tragic backstory of all, right for the conclusion, right for the end of the series. And again, you know, it makes sense that Ymir, the one who started all of this, was saved for last. And yeah, that that backstory certainly resonated. Um, it certainly hit hard. And unfortunately, you know, it, you know, I say unfortunately, but it's um, it's complicated. You know, her devotion to King Fritz, uh, it, it's complicated. I think it is quite complicated. It's not as simple as her being, you know, used or, you know, um, I mean, perhaps there's a, a sense of Stockholm Syndrome there, a semblance of Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, I mean, more than a semblance, right? Some, you could easily argue that, yeah, this is, um, this is the product of Stockholm Syndrome, right? But, you know, again, I do think it's a bit more complicated than that. But yeah, as of this point, I'm just hoping she gets her freedom. I hope she moves on from the path realm. It might be in the beginning stages of that, right? Now that uh, she's kind of relinquished that power or she's um, kind of passed it to Aaron. You know, uh, Aaron has acquired the, the powers of the founder or the founding Titan. Uh, in that sense, I suppose that whole notion of needing royal blood just goes out, right? That's done. That's done and dusted. Even that in itself is a bit of an illusion, right? You see here that she was able to pass it on. Uh, but that was the whole that was the whole thing, right? She just didn't have agency. She didn't have that agency. She just didn't even um she didn't even know that it was a possibility for her to let go, right? This is the reason Aaron needed to be here. This is why she wanted Aaron to be here. I mean, in Aaron, she certainly saw something she didn't have herself. And he has initiated the Stampede of the Titans, that apocalyptic scenario that's been looming above uh, the series for a long time now. Uh, it was just a matter of how large of a scale it was going to be. And, you know, if you were to ask Armin in this episode, who seemed quite baffled, quite... Um, I guess you can even say delusional, uh, momentarily at least, quite, um, I don't know, man. 
it, it was really strange to see him in that state uh, because, you know, given the fact that he already kind of clocked the p possibility of Aaron wanting to do a full-scale rumbling, a stampede of the Titans to flatten the earth, um, he already kind of clocked that possibility, right? Uh, it was in his mind. It was one of those things that you don't want to think about, but it's there, right? And you, you could tell that he was really trying to uh, kind of keep that buried. Uh, and now, you know, you see that he's kind of spelling it all out, right? And he's putting it out there and he's hoping that Mikasa might reassure him that that's not the case, but he knows, right? Essentially, he was in denial. And also in that sense, it kind of doubles as this expository tool, right? Uh, to make sure to let the audience know that Aaron has initiated the full-scale rumbling, right? Uh, so, you know, Armin, Armin's character is kind of there to confirm that as well. Um, Though, of course, uh, right in the conclusion, Aaron, um, a really different looking Aaron. I mean, that is not even Aaron anymore, is it? That is that is legitimately the devil of Parody, the devil of all Earth, essentially, right? He has taken that form, you know, he had this new Titan form, essentially. Uh, and that's because of this uh, organism kind of attached itself to Aaron now, right? It grew out of his body and attached to his head, right? So at least, you know, that's, that, there is that though, you know, th this organism is out now in the open, right? It's out there now. Uh, it's not this hidden thing that you can get to. Now it's out there in the open. Aaron is out there physically, right? In this new form and it is quite the new form. Um, it's this large, I mean, it's larger than the, the colossal titans that came out of the walls, right? It's insane. There's that one shot of Armin and Mikasa. Uh, I'd say it's one of the most iconic shots of the entire series. One of the most haunting shots of the entire series. You know, them on a rooftop. And in the distance, you see this new form of Aaron. Uh, Aaron Titan. Aaron founding Titan. And there's that one shot as the ribcage-like appearance is kind of, you know, uh, building, building and building. Uh, it kind of looked like a cage, right? Yet another cage. So it's like, yes, the, the walls have come down, right? Uh, and Aaron Yeager is on the move, but he's still as trapped as ever, right? That was the feeling I was getting here. I mean, yeah, in that sense, uh, Aaron Yeager, no matter how far he goes, right? No matter how far he travels outside of the walls, it feels like he's always trapped. But that image at the end, that, you know, look, um, I, I'm not even sure, you know, what that is. I know it's Aaron, but again, you know, it does, just feels like it's a totally different being almost, right? Like I mentioned, it's this twisted... Uh, demented looking figure at this point you know it, it kind of looked like part you know part of it kind of looked like his titan form but then part of it also kind of looked like human right um because you could see the marks on on the on the on the cheeks right yet he yet he looks so monstrous it was horrifying it was terrifying you know that look that face and you know i mentioned the progression of the series and you know being just shocked at uh at this uh knowing that it's at this point now you know, Aaron Yeager, Aaron Yeager, man, all that time ago, you know, I still remember f first, you know, starting the show. It kind of feels like it was not even that long ago. It was years ago at this point, but it feels like it wasn't even that long ago. Um, you know, look at Aaron Yeager now, from back then to now. This is, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to look at, you know, tough to take, really, to see, you know, that character turn into this. Um, even that kind of feels monumental in terms of a big story, you know, to see a protagonist uh, end up like this, you know, um, to be on this path now. It, you know, it's quite the progression. It really is. Um, and, you know, it, ultimately, all those things that they set up, all those things that he kind of stated himself, he, he ended up doing it, right? Uh, you go all the way back to season one, uh, there's a lot of great setup there, foreshadowing there in the final episode, in the finale, right? Be it Jean and Armin having that conversation, right? Um, be it him and Annie fighting it out and then him saying he'll destroy the world, right? Um, and, you know, earlier in the season, in the, in the forest, in the forest of the giant trees, Hecho, Levi Hecho, mentioning that, yeah, he, he's a true monster, right? That's in his nature, all of that, you know, all of that great setup in in season one even, right? I mean, of course, um, you know, there's a phenomenal setup in season one. And, you know, what, some of it just paid off right now, 79 episodes later. You know, essentially superior works of fiction 
uh, certainly require the author or the writer or the showrunner to acquire a godlike understanding of their uh, story, of the, the characters in the story, the locations, the history. Isayama-san has all of that. He's had that on lockdown since day one. I mean, this is just incredible stuff, right? It's incredible stuff. And you know, that that's that's one of the reasons I mentioned that, you know, I have a lot of faith in Isayama-san to land uh, a solid ending. You know, the track record is there. You know, the track record allows it. It allows me to have faith in Isayama-san. Uh, I mean, that is some track record, folks. Now, going back to Aaron uh, addressing the subjects of Ymir, you see that other subjects of Ymir outside of Paradis Island uh, also kind of, you know, uh, they know, they could hear Aaron Yeager, right? So he made it clear, you know, he's only out to protect his hometown, or sorry, not hometown, his home country, his home island, right? And the people here, the, the people he cares for, right? So everyone else out there, you know, subjects to Ymir, tough luck, right? Tough luck. Uh, the ones in Liberio, uh, you see, you know, the, the ones uh, that have the, the armbands, uh, and I believe that was Annie's uh, dad. Um, uh, yeah, I think it was. Uh, I mean, he certainly had the red band on, but yeah, the face, just the look, it just immediately reminded me of that conversation scene that was happening. Um, so yeah, so I guess he survived, right? Uh, I guess I finally have some confirmation <laughs> about him surviving that attack or not. So it looks like he survived. Unless I'm completely wrong here. Uh, I mean, the red armband is there, right? So it has to be a shifter's parent. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Annie's father. Um, but yeah, uh, they know. They know what's coming, right? Um, all those stories, uh, the horror stories or the possibilities that are always kind of, you know, out there or they knew about, it's finally happening. You know, the devil of parody is actually putting it into motion. He has put it into motion and those subjects of Ymir do not matter. Uh, to Aaron Yeager, at least, they do not matter, right? He only cares about the ones on parody. Uh, and even then, there's going to be collateral damage, right? This, this apocalyptic situation that he has just, you know, set into motion, I could see, you know, major characters dying, you know, dying because of this. This kind of brings that potential into the story now, right? Major death potential is there now, uh, given this insane situation. So, yeah, you know, there's certainly going to be collateral damage. You can already see it, right? You already see it, um, especially given the fact that all of them are exiting, right? Uh, there's the inner wall, then there's one after that, then one after that. So there is going to be damage, a lot of damage, a lot of death. But of course, that being said, I'm guessing Aaron can control them, right? Uh, maybe he can get them to not trample on certain things. Maybe he could get them to, or he could direct them, essentially, I don't know, let's see. But there was, they already kind of showed us that, okay, you know, there is going to be damage within Paradis as well. And, you know, um, a standout moment from that scene was Historia's appearance, right? Um, hmm. And, you know, I think it, was, it felt like she was the only one that was actually kind of really looking around inside that. Uh, now, again, you know, I'm not sure if they all got transferred to the Path Realm. I don't think they did, but it, it was... That was a visual depiction of it, though, right? Uh, that he is communicating through the path realm. Uh, but, you know, Historia looked like she was actually kind of looking, right? Um, again, Historia is royal blood, right? But, you know, that certainly excited me. It excited me to see Historia again. And, you know, of course, before they even showed me Historia, you know, you see that through the Fanner Ymir, there's a lot of parallels to Historia. I mean, there's a lot of parallels to a lot of different characters in that sense. You know, the Fanner Ymir is being kind of um, connected to a lot of these different characters. You know, be it a Scout Ymir, a lot of parallels there. Uh, again, like I mentioned, Historia. I think there's even a parallel to maybe not in that extreme of a sense, but, you know, there is a parallel to Mikasa and Eren as well, right? That relationship, right? That complicated relationship. Uh, I think there is a there is a bit of a parallel to that as well. Um, I'll get into that because I kind of want to connect that to uh, another point I'm going to make, um, you know, end game point. But yeah, I'll come back to that. Now going back to Historia, to me her reaction felt a bit different, almost as if she wasn't as shocked as the others. Right? Uh, you see, some of the others are just like really. Uh, um, 
you know, there's two things going on. First of all, you know, they, they're they kind of um, having this trippy experience of, you know, that voice in their head uh, that is being connected to them through the, uh, through the path realm, right? Aaron's voice. And the other part being, you know, them having to hear about the, the stampede of the Titans. No life form is going to exist outside of Parody Island. Uh, they had to hear that. But you see Historia's reaction, it's not similar to some of these others, right? You see Reiner, you see Gabby, you see uh, even Mika and Armin, right? But Historia, I don't know, man. It kind of looked like, almost like a knowing look. So, you know, the, the angle I'm trying to take here is that does Historia know about this or did she know about this? Did Aaron share this information uh, with Historia. <clears throat> Listen, let's put aside any romantic uh, connection or anything. Just beyond that, there, there's always been this connection, right? Aaron and uh, Historia. Uh, it kind of developed during season three, part one. You know, she told Aaron that she's an ally, that she's always there for him, right? Uh, if needed. So yeah, you know, there is a, a different type of connection there, uh, Aaron and Historia. And, you know, the reason I say it's not far-fetched is because of another point I brought up maybe in my season four, part one uh, reactions, maybe. Uh, I brought it up at some point, you know, that there's no chance in hell that someone like Flock is going to follow Aaron, right? If Aaron told him that he's following Zeke's plan. No way, no chance. So in order to get Flock on his side, he must have told him about his actual plan, the rumbling plan, right? Um... Again, I don't know. It remains to be seen if he if he would tell him about the, the full-scale uh, rumbling or the full-scale Stampede of the Titans. But he must have told him about, you know, he must have given him some inclination about his actual plan, right? Uh, that it's not in line with uh, Zeke's plan. Uh, because, because, of course, if it was in line with Zeke's plan, Flock is not going to follow Aaron, right? Because it goes against the things Flock believes in. You know, you see that Historia has been kept really far apart She's, she's not even close to that area, right? Um, she's on some like secluded farm, essentially. So yeah, I don't know, man. Let's see. I know it's really late in the game, um, but you know, I certainly hope, I certainly hope they go back to Historia and explain some things, right? Uh, I feel like just that, I feel like the Nile explanation to those other, you know, uh, military guys, uh, just people that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. I feel like, I need something a bit more than that for Historia, right? I I feel like there is a possibility there that there could have been other moments, you know, Historia and Aaron, perhaps, um, you know, just like how they, there was a secret meeting, uh, Yelena and Aaron. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping there are other moments like that that could that could be kind of sneaked in. But again, it all depends, right? It all depends. Like these next few episodes, I'm not even sure. You know, is it's. it's Essentially, it's going to be the aftermath of this, right? And how the characters around Aaron kind of deal with this uh, insane situation they've been put in now. Um, uh, because, you know, even though he's kind of going up against uh, everyone that's uh, beyond Parody, it's not as if Parody is just this, like, really safe place at the moment, right? There's colossal titans, stamp, you know, stomping through. There's mindless titans um, in the streets of Shiganshina. You know, Zeke saw Mindless Titans, uh, the Abnormal Titans. Um, so yeah, it's not a safe place at the moment. They, you know, a lot of them have to survive. And then of course, speaking of Zeke, uh, there was a quick glimpse. There was a quick glimpse of this organism, right? This parasite uh, kind of, you know, latching itself onto Zeke. It kind of, you know, just kind of jumps at him, almost like a face hugger. You see a quick animation of it. It's like a split second thing. It kind of, you know, once Aaron's eyes move, it, you know, it lunges at Zeke. So I guess it's kind of latched onto Zeke as well. So it'll be interesting to see how Zeke is shown the next time he's shown, if he's shown again. But yeah, at this point in time, again, there's a before this episode and after this episode. After this episode, after the things that have gone down, yes, it's certainly in its end game now. It's on that path now, right? Proper. Because Aaron Yeager, the devil of parody, the, you know, column... Uh, call him all the names in the book, you know, um, the, the devil of all earth, all of that. You know, he's taken that on. He's taken that persona on. He's taken that, um, he's taken that upon himself, right? Uh, and now I think it's just a matter of time, essentially. Uh, but there, before that could happen, before that can happen, there's going to be a lot of death. There's going to be a lot of death. 
uh, and he made the choice. You know, he he made the choice to stomp out uh, all all life outside of Parody Island. But you know, before I go any further, yes, you know, there's different angles to this, but of course, you know, this option is the option that Aaron knows or, or thinks is the best option to, you know, help his uh, friend survive. You know, if you want to save Armin and Mikasa and the others, you have to go through with this, right? This is the plan. And again, it remains to be seen the, the glimpses of the future he has seen. But yeah, you know, this is the path he had to take, right? This is uh, how he protects his friends and the people he cares for, right? He knows this is this had to be done to get them to that point. Uh, and, you know, perhaps have a life after this. So, you know, he took it upon himself to become the devil of parody, right? Um, so, yeah, now, you know, I've spoke, you know, I've spoken of um, potential endgame uh, in season four, part one, you know, that he he's essentially, yeah, he did end up becoming the final boss in that sense and that his own friends are probably going to have to cut him down. Uh, but easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. But, you know, in this case, in this situation, uh, who are the likeliest to actually have access to Aaron at some point or be able to speak with him at some point down the line that can actually get close enough to him, right? Th there's two that come to mind immediately, right? His closest friends, his family essentially, Arbin and Mikasa, right? I feel like those two are going to be able to get close to him at some point, right? A lot of things have to play out first, but, you know, I think at some point they are going to, they are going to get through to Aaron to be able to speak with him, right? But that then opens the possibility of one of them actually taking Aaron out, right? And, you know, you see that uh, in that sense, it, it could really be similar to Game of Thrones, right? I mean, spoilers for Game of Thrones, you know, maybe skip the next little bit if you don't want to hear this. Essentially, to me, it kind of feels like it's going to be really similar to uh, John and Daenerys, right? Jon Snow was the only one that was able to get close enough to Daenerys to do the thing that needed to be done, right? To kill her, right? To end it. Uh, and even then, you know, it, it was a it, it was something that tormented Jon Snow, right, for a long time. Uh, and he questioned the choice he made. Yet, you know, he did it, right? And he was the one that was in a position to get actually close enough to pull it off. So, you know, in that sense, or that's the reason I think, you know, Armin and Mikasa getting close enough to him uh, to then having one of them actually, you know, land the killing blow. Right? I could see that. I could totally see that possibility. Now, you know, earlier I mentioned Mikasa, the Mikasa and Eren parallel to potentially uh, Ymir and King Fritz. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that, you know, it's the same abuse or anything. You know, certainly in that sense, it's not comparable. I mean, the relationship the family Ymir shared with uh, King Fritz or had with King Fritz it's complicated. I'll get into that in a bit, but I see a bit of a parallel there, right? You know, there you have the founder Ymir who has this displaced um, understanding of love almost um, or of uh, being needed, right? She was being used as a tool, but, you know, that to her was, um, I don't know, to her that kind of felt like she was important, that she was needed. Right. Um, but ultimately, she was just being used as a tool. And you see that, uh, unfortunately, you know, Zeke, a descendant of royal blood, uh, kind of took the same approach. You know, he, he starts to command her. Yeah. And, you know, she sees that, you know, she sees that the cycle continues. Uh, then, of course, you know, Aaron Yeager being the difference. Right. I think it ultimately comes down to uh, Ymir Fritz being this individual uh, that wants to be loved and, you know, love others right? And care for others. Um, and yeah, you know, again, that kind of plays out in uh, Historia's character arc as well, right? Um, earlier, she she does have that mentality as well, right? And uh, Ymir, Scott Ymir kind of helps her break out of that mentality. You know, but this whole notion of uh, King Fritz using her as a tool to build his empire and pff, wow, she certainly played a part in building that empire, right? To her, it didn't feel like that. You know, it feels like she understood it in a different manner, right? Uh, how she wanted to understand it. Uh, you know, I think she felt that being used or, you know, uh, being uh, being of help to King Fritz is an important thing here, that she's needed, right? That uh, she pl she's playing her part, right? 
So I don't know, man. It's it's complicated. It's really complicated. I think one of the most important scenes um, in this flashback was of the founder looking on as that couple is getting married and sharing, you know, um, a passionate moment. Um, you know, seeing that connection, right? Seeing that love on display, you could tell that that is something she wanted, right? Um, that connection, you know, to, to care for someone like that or to be cared for uh, in that manner. You could see that she longed for that. Um, and, you know, it appears that she kind of latched onto the idea that maybe she she can get that from this king. Now, circling back to that Mikasa and Aaron parallel I was trying to make uh, with, um, you know, founder Ymir and King Fritz, you know, of course, it's not that type of abuse. You know, it doesn't have a lot of those things. But, you know, there is, I think you can make that comparison. You know, of course, um, one of the things uh, that's been kind of established since the beginning of the series, you know, really early in the series, you know, Mikasa's love for Aaron, right? Uh, and the fact that he doesn't quite reciprocate it in the same manner or at the same level. Though, of course, there's been key moments like the season two finale, now and forever, I'll wrap that scarf around you, to let us know that indeed Aaron has, he has some some type of, you know, uh, attachment to Mikasa as well. And, you know, now more so than ever, uh, especially, you know, season four, part one, that table scene, uh, and just this happening now, she's going to feel that disconnect. She's really going to feel that dis disconnect from Aaron. Um, so yeah, you know, in that sense, I see a parallel to Ymir and King Fritz as well. But again, like I mentioned, Ar uh, Armin and uh, Mikasa are, are the ones that are most likely to get near Aaron or get close to him, right? So yeah, you know, um, even though there might be a parallel there, I could also see a different approach to it as well, right? Uh, maybe Mikasa might be able to do something that Ymir wasn't able to do, right? Ymir just could not make that choice, not until recently at least, after spending an eternity in the path realm. You know, Aaron kind of helped her there. Um, but, you know, Mikasa might have to uh, make the choice, you know, even though she loves Aaron and she's cared for him her entire life, she might have to, you know, kill him. She might have to put an end to this. Uh, again, you know, it could be a combination of Armin and Mikasa, uh, maybe Armin or Mikasa. But I think Mikasa having to kill Eren, that that kind of really resembles that Game of Thrones uh, angle I was talking about a bit earlier as well, right? Now, there is that other angle, um, the what-if situation, right? If Eren was to actually kill everyone beyond Paradis, right? Uh, if Paradis was actually uh, the last refuge, the last place that has humans left, right? The subjects of Ymir, essentially. I mean, there's always a possibility of that, that the ending could kind of take that angle, right? And it comes full circle that it actually ends up being how it was established early in season one, that all of humanity has been uh, killed off outside of the walls and the last remaining humans are inside the walls, right? Though there are no walls, there's no need for any walls, but it would be close to that setup, right? Say if it was to happen like that, right? What's the one thing that's guaranteed? Conflict. Conflict is guaranteed, even if it's just the people on Paradis. Sooner or later, you know, after enough time passes, there is going to be conflict. There are going to be, uh, you know, different uh, groups kind of, you know, breaking apart, uh, especially, especially since there's no walls anymore. People, you know, doing their own thing um different ideals um so yeah you know uh, even in that sense it's not it, it's not as if there's some guarantee that even if it is the last uh even if it's the last people on the planet right the the people on paradis there's no guarantee that it's going to be some utopia right uh conflict is always going to exist um it's just human nature it just is so, you know, there's that angle as well. But I just don't, I, I don't think Asiyama san is going to ha have it be that bleak, right? <laughs> to, to end it off on that note, I think there is going to be a semblance of hope uh, in this ending. And then again, it kind of goes back to that notion of Aaron knowing some of these things ahead of time, uh, having seen glimpses of uh, his future memories through his father, uh, Grisha. You know, is there... Is there, a, is there an amount that he has in mind, right, uh, that he actually wants to kill, 
Uh, is there is there like a, like a threshold almost that he feels is the right amount to give his loved ones? I know it's incredibly fucked up to think it, think about it in that manner, but you know, is there something in his mind that he believes is the right amount uh, to give his fa- uh, to give his family, his friends, his loved ones a chance? Right, give them a proper chance, or he just keeps going. He just keeps going until they come for him. And in terms of the actual, you know, Stampede of the Titans, it is some stunning imagery, uh, some horrific imagery, but some of the most memorable imagery of the series as well. You know, it's been, it's been kind of foreshadowed and hinted, and you know, looming above for so long. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, it, it almost instantly kind of transforms into this hellish landscape, right? Uh, that you're transported to this hellish landscape. Um, of course, you know, there's that red motif uh, as well. Um, wow. I mean, yeah, it, it certainly got that message across, right? That this, indeed, this is that apocalyptic situation <laughs> that they all thought it would be, right? Uh, and of course, that new score, that new track, incredible new track. Oh my goodness, Yamamoto. <laughs> Yamamoto is just out here dropping banger after banger, right? And speaking of season two, uh, this uh, you know, the ending specifically, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That ending had a lot of information, a lot of really interesting information. And to me, that was clear the first time I watched it and did a, you know, frame by frame of that. Um, certainly go check that out. I'll probably drop a link to that. I think, I think um, it might be a bit dated, right? The production might be a bit dated, but yeah, you know, in that, I did predict or I did theorize that you know those three girls are taking part in a cannibalistic ritual and I did theorize that these girls are indeed Maria Rose and Sina and that you know that that's the king their father the one thing I wasn't able to you know really grasp from that I guess uh, sir, I, I don't think I had enough information at that point to come to that conclusion but yeah I didn't know that those are Ymir's daughters right I knew it's the king's daughters but I didn't know that it'd be uh, the founder of Ymir's daughters Maria Rose and Sina. But yeah, you know, in this one, in this episode, they confirmed that, yeah, that whole thing of consuming, uh, you know, the spinal fluid or, you know, back in those days, I mean, he didn't even know, you know, King Fritz didn't even actually know if it was going to work. He just, he just did it anyways, right? He told these children to cannibalize their dead mother's body, right? Yes, it, you know, it ended up actually happening, right? Uh, each one of them kind of got, uh, parts of her soul and then I guess it multiplied and kind of at some point each one of the nine titans kind of had its own uh, shifter right its own holder but at that first stage you see that the tree in the path realm only has three uh, branches as well right uh, so yeah it, it begins with uh, Maria Rose and Sina I guess I guess each one of them have three titans um, and then as they you know uh uh, as they had children, it kind of, you know, got passed down and it kind of opened up and multiplied and uh, again, kind of became more of an individual thing rather than each one of the daughters having three or four each. And you see that different bits and portions are accurate, right? In terms of, uh, say, that day, right? Grisha is kind of going through uh, the depictions on the tapestries almost. Um, and, you know, he's speaking of how the Fener Ymir helped build roads and bridges, uh, right? Uh, so part of that is certainly true. You know, she was certainly uh, quite uh, important in that uh, sense. But again, uh, it was only for the Aldean Empire. It was only for King Fritz. Uh, and she certainly did the other aspect as well, right? She certainly took part in the other aspect as well. Like Kruger mentioned to uh, Grisha all that time ago, you know, under the Eldian Empire, she was this goddess, right? And uh, for the Marleyan Empire, uh, under the Marleyan regime, she's this pawn of the devil, right? So again, anyone could be a god or a devil. Um, people just need to believe it. As I'm on the topic of uh, the founder Ymir, Ymir Fritz, uh, let's get into that flashback, uh, that backstory. I mean, incredibly tragic backstory. This is the most, <laughs> I mean, it's not even a competition, and it's not, it's not a competition, but, you know, this is the most tragic character of the entire story. Oh my goodness, this is, this is beyond hellish. It's just insane that this individual has had a life like this, right? Uh, and still to this day, kind of cursed, right? Uh, to roam in the path realm for eternity, making these monsters. Uh, though, of course, she might be in the early stages of finally exiting 
the path where I'm finally moving on. Let's see how it plays out. But, uh, you know, the look of the, first of all, the look of the flashback, um, I really liked it. It really had this uh, almost, you know, gothic, emotionless, lifeless look about it, didn't it? Uh, almost kind of like a dark fable out of a history book. Um, and it certainly had that somber tone, um, you know, that new track that I first heard in Memories of the Future. Uh, I loved how it kind of accompanied that uh, flashback. And like I mentioned, you know, the coloring really reminded me of the color grades for films like Gladiator, 300, uh, Sin City even. Um, I thought it was quite effective. Uh, it, it was certainly a stylized look. So for, you know, young Ymir, uh, you know, all her life, she's just known violence and uh, slavery and abuse, right? So much so that that's all, that's all she can really comprehend. Or, you know, the things she tries to comprehend are kind of built around that trauma, right? A trauma, traumatized child who grew into a traumatized adult. Once she does kind of, you know, pass on to the path realm uh, for an eternity, essentially, she reverts back to her childlike state, right? Uh, because that's her, that's her mentality. Her mentality is still stuck in that, right? She didn't have the emotional or psychological um, growth or capacity to, you know, make those choices for herself, right? To her, you know, being used as a tool, uh, again, this is my take on it, but, you know, to her being used as a tool uh, felt like that she is important, that she's needed, right? That she is... Uh, that she is useful to her king, to this individual, who she's kind of latched onto because she might have latched onto for the wrong ideas or thinking um, that, you know, there is a connection there. Though, of course, he only used her as a tool. But you see that even after this um, godlike figure, essentially, or entity or being, um, you know, kind of uh, presents itself, presents this opportunity, though, of course, it's uh, perhaps in um, an act of self-preservation as well, right? For this uh, uh, organism, right? This um, source of all living matter, as Kruger described. Um, it's, it's a parasite, essentially, right? So it saw the opportunity and it took it as well. But it also gave Ymir something quite incredible, right? I mean, if you think about it, nothing good really came out of that, of her, you know, running into that thing, um, that chance encounter, uh, deep inside that tree. Um, but yeah, you know, nothing good came of that. That actually almost amplified her suffering and her abuse. You know, part of her does have that inclination that, you know, something is off. She is suffering uh, for an eternity in this path realm. And for that reason, of course, you know, she, she kind of had that beacon of hope that is Aaron Yeager, uh, the attack titan, right? Um, or Aaron Yeager, actually. Let's say Aaron Yeager, uh, that one day he is going to show up it took 2,000 years. Of course, 2,000 years in the path realm is just some something unimaginable, uh, something just insane, right? Uh, Mind-numbing. I mean, she hoped that one day someone like Aaron could show up. And yes, it finally happened. He showed up. Someone like Aaron showed up. Um, and, you know, even before that, before she passes on, you know, she jumps in front of the king and takes that spear. But, you know, that moment, I think the moment she sees the, the king's reaction that even after something like this, the king, there's no change, right? There's no change. The king still considers her just a slave, right? Um, she kind of let go at that moment from the looks of it. Uh, she could have recovered, right? Of course she could have recovered. Um, she's a founding titan, uh, but she let go. She let go. But uh, that subservience was not, you know, let go. That was still there. That was still, that was still a part of her uh, and it remained a part of her. Uh, because that's all she's known, right? Um, even in death, even after death, she continues to serve the king, the royal blood, right? Um, that's how deep-seated this um, mentality was for her. Uh, she did she did some terrible things for the Eldian Empire, for King Fritz. Though, of course, uh, you know, the hot topic of last episode or the discussion in the last episode was the Attack Titan. And the Attack Titan does come from Ymir Fritz, right? It originates from Ymir Fritz. So, you know, in that sense, it feels like uh, the Attack Titans always felt like this uh, lone wolf, right? An outlier in that sense. There was a tiny, um, you know, hope for freedom within uh, the, uh, the founder Ymir, Ymir Fritz. I guess it was kind of like her yearning for freedom, right? It might be tiny, 
It might have been tiny, but it was there, right? And that was kind of like the Attack Titan. And of course, the Attack Titan does go to Aaron Jaeger. Um, and he's there. And essentially, you know, he finally... The, the person, that someone that she was hoping for, finally showed up. And in that sense, you know, uh, beyond Zeke just being a royal and her coming to his rescue, it appears that, you know, she wanted to keep Zeke alive for another reason as well. So Aaron could reach the coordinate, right? Uh, because they needed Zeke. They certainly needed Zeke to get there as well, right? Uh, someone of royal blood, a titan of royal blood, and the holder of the founding titan, right? They make contact and they both end up in the coordinate. And of course, it, she finally, finally, after all that time, you know, that individual showed up. Uh, he gave her a choice, right? He made her realize that, you know, it's okay. It's okay. She can, she can make a choice, you know? She can make her own choice in this. Uh, that she's not a god, she's just a person, right? Um, and that she doesn't have to obey anyone. So, you know, in that sense, it's uh, it's quite interesting to see that side of Eren. And that side's always been there. That side's always been there. And, you know, speaking of Eren Jaeger and his new form, uh, wow, I mean, it's a menacing new form. Uh, though I haven't seen it completely just yet. You know, I did see his face at the end there. But, you know, I, did I see a hint of this in uh, Season 3 Part 1? Uh, there's that really strange moment. I, I remember my, I remember a distinct reaction to that moment uh, because it was so jarring and so different and strange than anything else they, they showed me at that point. It was, um, I remember, you know, uh, Mikasa was kind of yelling, Aaron, slowly. It was, it was like a fading noise or a faded noise of her getting through the crystal uh, and they break through the crystal, right, to get him out. But like, there's this image of just Aaron's head, but then the spine attached to it right? Um, this is um, the Underground Chapel episodes. Uh, and of course, you know, this final uh, endgame action Aaron has taken. Uh, you know, if you circle all the way back to early Aaron and his uh, motivations back then, you know, he wanted to uh, eradicate all Titans, right? You go back to episode two of the series. Um, now, all this time later, he's using Titans to, <laughs> to you know, eradicate humanity outside of uh, Paradis. So how about that, right? Um, though, of course, you know, his goal is still there. The The Titan goal is still there. You know, I, I do feel or I do believe he is also trying to bring an end to the Titans, right? No more Titans. I think that's certainly a part of this plan as well. But yeah, uh, the attack Titan. Uh, Ymir's one lifeline, right? Um, and, you know, speaking of uh, the attack Titan and speaking of Eren, you know, it's clear that Aaron understands that the thing he's doing here is not the right thing, right? Or he, again, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of difficult. It's a bit of a tricky situation. You know, in season four, part one, they established that Aaron understands and he understands that there are a lot of good people out here beyond Paradis, right? Uh, that was one of, that, that was one of the, the great parts of that season, of season four, part one, you know, Aaron being in the barrio and it being established that yes, you know, he understands. He understands the struggle. He understands that there's good people out here. This just happens to be the option, the best option for him, uh, you know, to protect his loved ones, uh, to give them a chance, right? He understands that there a lot of good people are about to die, you know, but he has to go through with it. And of course, you know, the performance, uh, the voice acting on display is just phenomenal. Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, Aaron's yells as he's... Uh, you know, kind of trying to rip his hand out of uh, the shackles uh, or at least his thumbs out of the shackles. Uh, I didn't even know that was possible. I thought it was like this cosmic, you know, uh, I don't know, just cosmic shackles, right? They're not really there. But like, I felt that maybe they're kind of like definitive, like permanent until removed by uh, the founder herself. But yeah, no, he ripped his hand out of it. Yeah, quite the episode. It gave me one of the most heartbreaking backstories <laughs> Uh, even beyond Shingeki, man, that is just one of the most heartbreaking backstories I've seen in anything. And just the character itself, Ymir Fritz, is... Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of like the mid-episode card, right? It, it kind of uh, set that thing up, that parasite up as uh, a potential god entity that kind of came to Ymir's uh, rescue in that moment. Uh, it sensed that, you know, this individual, this creature could use something like this, uh, right? It kind of felt pity. Uh, I believe that's what it said, right? It had pity on Ymir um, and her situation. Or it was a, a case of, you know, kind of finding a host. But yeah, it came to her in a moment of immense suffering, 
right? And it appears that only more suffering came out of it. You know, her becoming this titan, this godlike figure didn't really do much for her. It actually, you know, uh, she actually ended up doing a lot of terrible things because of it. But yeah, I think that might be it for this episode. Um, I mean, yeah, once again, incredible episode. Um, again, and even on the production side of things, um, you know, the editing was fantastic in this. You know, there's a great moment as Ymir is kind of just building those colossal titans, right? And then uh, there's the narration of the king and then um, Aaron's line kind of cuts in, right? Just cuts through. Um, and I, I thought that was a fantastic editing choice, uh, fantastic directing there as well. Um, I'll stop it. It stops now, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, if you enjoyed this, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you're interested in full length or full opacity, consider checking out the link in the description or the pinned comment for the Patreon page. Also, there's a link to my social media, uh, Twitter specifically, if you're into that. So consider checking that out. And of course, it'll be really interesting to see um, people's thoughts on this. You know, characters like Jean, right? Characters like Yelena and Anya Capone and Connie, all of these characters, right? their thoughts on this the stampede of the titans and that Aaron has gone there but yeah that's about it for this one thank you for joining me and i hope to see you again soon for the next one until then take it easy